the 11th day of March, 2019, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this, indeed, is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com and also heard in a variety of other places. So, welcome to you if you're catching us later on, further on down the stream, all that kind of good stuff. It is uh, good to have you along for this particular moon day or Monday. Anyway, uh, this week there's going to be some interesting changes coming up and... Apparently, we're not going to get to uh, test certain things tonight, but <laughs> there's going to be some new phone lines. There's going to be uh, some new, possibly, places that were being broadcast through by the end of the week. But uh, apparently, one thing was not ready for tonight. I just checked it now, and uh, it's not quite running. But uh, we are on in all of our usual places, so guess I'll hold my announcement for later on. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. I really didn't want to have to go through a test run tonight and shock the hell out of people with Jordan Maxwell because <laughs> we can always do that next week. Jordan Maxwell is with me, of course, if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, in case you had never heard of him before or something stupid like that. If you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, okay, that is the only website which is Jordan Maxwell's. Over there you find the... Research Society, you find a lot of stuff in the public area. The Research Society, you have to join. And also, there's a couple of videos for download. There is a donate button, all that good stuff. But there's only one website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's, and that is jordanmaxwellshow.com. you got to put all those things together, by the way. And, and emails to Jordan, feedback, uh, questions, obviously, all that kind of stuff. Also appreciated, like I say, along with donations. Right now, Jordan's looking to uh, figure out a way to get a, a new computer last time we spoke to him. So let's see how he's doing tonight before we continue the series on religion, which, believe it or not, this would be the 19th one. Anyway, Jordan, how are you tonight, first of all, sir? Well, I think I'm okay. We'll find out as we go on. Right. Uh you, you so may notice an odd sound in my that? sinuses there. I'm sorry, Jordan. You know, it, it's been rainy and terribly nasty here today, and it's just wreaking havoc on me. H how is the weather where you are? Raining and snowing. Oh, okay. Lovely. I'm in, I'm in northern part of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, <clears throat> up in the mountains. <clears throat> so today, tomorrow, is supposed to be raining and snowing, and it's raining now, so... One never knows what tomorrow's going to bring. It has been snowing up here pretty pretty good. Mm. See, so, it's an interesting thing, the weather, I'll tell you. And and you can, you can hear it in your voice, too. But today I, I'm listening to myself back, and I can definitely hear it. Uh, but but it's not that either one – well, you know, it's not that either one of us is particularly sick, but when the weather shifts, your voice changes, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it does, and so does your mood. <laughs> See, now Everything that's, in your life changes. You know, that's the truth. And we've talked a lot about biblical stuff. Now, I don't know what direction you want to go in, but I have a question right off the top considering, uh, you know, my, my thoughts about the weather today and, uh, you know, lightning and acts of God and how people discuss things regarding disasters and the weather. And, you yeah. know, it's kind of fascinating because... Uh, no matter what religion we ever examine, whether it's the ancient religions, whether it's the, you know, what they call the Roman myths, what it's, uh, or, or the Greek myths, take your pick, they're about the same thing. Uh, if you take a look at the, the oldest of things that we don't even know the names of, right? It seems as though the, the gods often manipulate the weather when they're pleased, uh, that, you know, they give great, uh, 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 comfort to the farmers, right? Uh, yep. they, they make it easy on you so you don't have to freeze to death, but you make them angry. The gods will come and strike you with terrible weather and stuff like that. And, and that was kind of in my mind for tonight, but maybe you have something else in your mind. Well, <clears throat> we know that the uh, God of the Old Testament, the Jewish God of the Old Testament, is based on Zeus, the ancient Greek god. <clears throat> Zeus was the king of the gods. <clears throat> and so we have overwhelming evidence in your face in the book of Job that the God of the Old Testament Bible is Zeus because it says 
if you go back to the reference works on Zeus, <clears throat> Zeus was the god of lightning and thunder. He was a warring god, and he was among the stars. So he was called the you know, he was called the great god of the stars, mm-hmm. and he was in the heavens, and he threw lightning down onto the earth, and he thundered. And that was the one of the two things that especially known about Zeus was he he was a god of lightning and thunder. Well, well in the Old Testament it says uh, Job is talking about God and he said he thunders wonderfully with his voice and his lightning f- strikes fear into the hearts of mankind when he throws his lightning bolts and when he thunders wonderfully with his voice. Well, who could that be if it isn't Zeus? And we have other we have other indications that the Bible is talking about Zeus, and we talked about that before. And that's really an important point that it looks like the ancients were telling us that Zeus was the god over the earth. And in the Middle East, they do have a canal named after Zeus. It's called the Suez Canal. The Suez is Zeus spelled backwards. And so the God of the Old Testament was Zeus. And how did the Romans pronounce Zeus? It was in Greek, Z-E-U-S. But in Latin, for, for God, even today, the Latin language, God is Deus. Like Zeus, but Deus, D E U S, D E U S, like Jesus, is J E S U S. So Jesus and Zeus are talking about the same God, and so Zeus was a god with a beard. He was a god of the heavens. He was he appointed all the royalty on the earth the bible says that he was appointing the royalty on the earth and that's what the uh, the um, the, uh, <clears throat> the reference books say about zeus he appoints the royalty mm. so therefore the royalty go prance around their gold chariots and they say that they have a divine right of kings they have a divine right why because zeus appointed them how did zeus appoint them I mean, did he call them up to heaven and put a crown on their head? No. The Pope of Rome anointed all the kings and queens and princesses and, and the princes and all the potentates and all the most powerful people in European royalty were all put there by the Pope because he represents the Father, the Holy Father who talks to God. He was the original Godfather. And so that's why everybody today, even today, all the politicians around the world, the the Bushes and the the uh, you know all the American politicians go to Rome so that they can bow down on their knees and kiss the ring of the Holy Father who talks to God, so they can bow on their knees and show worship to the Godfather. Well, let me, let me interrupt you for a moment because we, we've been through this and, and I, and I absolutely value where you're going here, but there's something to be said about universal truth and syncretism, right? Yeah. Um, and, and here's a fascinating thing. No matter what culture you go to, have you taken notice? And, and this, this now kind of goes outside of the framework that you're usually in, Jordan, but bear with me a moment. When you take a look at the Norse gods, their chief deity uh, wields lightning. <laughs> he just does. The The Chinese had several chief deities who are the gods of war. They are the, 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 the strongest of all. And they wielded lightning. Uh, yep. The Native Americans will tell you that the powerful, the, the wicked ones, the ones that really shake the earth and make things rumble, they make the lightning and the thunder uh, in, in several different ways, right? It, it, it mm-hmm. comes from the chief deity. It's this very fascinating thing that no matter what point in history you look at, what culture, what part of the planet you're on, there is this universal theme about lightning. And this being, you know, the, the, uh, even, even in common phrases today, right? You know, strike me down, you know, and people picture 
being struck by <laughs> lightning, like lightning is like the ultimate signal from God himself. Yep. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what, you know, again, Christians will, will, will think about that. You know, maybe somebody will be struck dead. If, if you picture it in your head and you're a Christian and you're even a, a, a five-year-old kid, you're automatically taught that this is the kind of thing that God could do at any moment. Because lightning is so powerful, so incredible, and it is the the thundering thing that drops down and falls. It's well, and it also comes from heaven, and that's what God is. It comes from out, out there. It comes from heaven. Oh, right, <laughs> right. But 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 it's really interesting to me that like no matter what culture we're talking about, you know, they they had different values. They valued life differently. They, uh, you know, did commerce differently. They might have organized their families differently. But this one thing seems to be. All the way around, no matter what, lightning, right? And and the, right. the big fire show that that comes from the flashes in the sky and things like that. Um, even when uh, the, the the first nuclear tests were done, right? Uh, mm-hmm. What what did they talk about? Oh, we we have unleashed the wrath of God on the world because of this big flash. That comes yep, from that's the heavens. Exactly right. And, that's precisely right. But but isn't that odd that no matter what culture you go to, no matter what time in history, that that's always the thing, you know? That, well, that, look at no matter how manly you may feel you are, and no matter how much uh, how how much experience you've had in life, and you're not afraid of anything. Sometimes lightning storms can be very scary, even to an adult can be very frightening because when you see lightning striking real close to you, and I mean totally incredible bolts of electricity uh, hitting close to you, and the thunder will scare the death out of you, scare you. I mean, really loud thunder that you're not expecting. It could frighten you. So all mankind is the same. We're all people, and we're all affected the same way. And I don't care what country you come from, if you get... See, if you're very near a lightning storm, it's very frightening. And if you hear the thunder crashing, uh, it can really affect you spiritually. It, you know, it affects you and you think, my God, that was powerful. What if that lightning had hit me? And that thunder, it just shakes the whole house. And so I can see how mankind has always been impressed with the signs in the heavens, you know, the, the, God throwing his lightning and frightening you. And so I understand how it could happen. Well, yeah. Now, what's really weird, though, is when, when we talked uh, deeply about uh, Catholicism and the fact that, uh, you know, you, you can see the evidence. And we talked about the, the deity, Dagon, right? And why mm-hmm. is it that it looks like the Pope has a fish on his head? Well, because he does, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, th- this is interesting, too. But, see... The funny thing is that right there is proof that there is uh, uh, divided loyalties, you see. I mean, if, if you're a man on a boat, uh, you, you may be concerned with the heavens, but you are certainly concerned with the water and what it's doing. And That's therefore, right. thinking about the Greek and Roman pantheons, right, uh, one might say, well, then I guess you're more concerned about the uh, the wrath or the good favor of one way or the other. Poseidon or Neptune. Uh, see, here, here we go, because let's remember that that's, you know, you, you can find Neptune up there in the heavens as well, uh, just like you can find, <laughs> right? Poseidon, the god of the sea. Yeah. Of course. So, it, it, but, but it's interesting that, uh, there, there's this automatic idea. I think people fail to recognize that, uh, Catholicism is really, uh, a, a truly a, a, a pagan collection of symbols, and th- there is proof right there. They, they are at the one point seeming to bow to Zeus, right? Let, let's let's stick with the Greek version of it, right? Uh, they're bowing to Zeus, but they're also bowing to Poseidon because Poseidon would be the one who rules Dagon because Dagon would almost be like the Kraken, if you will, in Clash of the Titans, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. I You're mean, right. you know, not exactly because it's a little different, but but it's still a big sea monster, you know. That's right. That's that, exactly right. That is of supernatural origin, like the Kraken, one of the Titans, which is in the sea, and uh, ultimately, one would say that that your 
now dealing in 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 a mixed pantheon of sorts here. It's not even the Greek pantheon per se because Dagon's not in the Greek pantheon. Uh, but no. you know, th- there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there, and and those aren't the only two that are represented in the collection of Catholicism, are they? No, not at all. Catholicism has it's like a, uh, a smorgasbord. You, uh, Judaism is like a smorgasbord, for instance, because in the Old Testament you could go back and find all kinds of uh, references to ancient gods and ancient concepts and belief systems of the prehistoric and ancient people, and it's all in Judaism. And there's so much in the religion of Judaism that goes back to the ancient and most ancient of times. <clears throat> we know where it comes from. If you study that kind of subject, you'll know where it comes from. And like I said, it's right there in the book of Job, <clears throat> where Job said, God thunders wonderfully with his voice. And he f- throws fear into the hearts of man by throwing his lightning bolts to the earth. Well, that's that's Zeus. But then you go on to talk about how uh, Jesus fed his, his followers with two fish. That's Pisces. It still goes back to the heavens. It goes back to astrology, astrotheology, the worship of the gods in the heavens. Uh, it's Religion is really quite a bag <laughs> And that's why there are a lot of people who question their religion. A lot of people are questioning everything now. But they should question their religious beliefs because that's where it's really obvious that you don't have the truth. You may think you have the truth. You may be happy where you are in your religion, but you have no idea in the world what's actually going on and what you're actually involved in until you do some study. And so that's what I've been doing. That's what I want to do is I want to help people to understand what their belief systems are and where they come from because it was sure, like the scripture said, to know the truth and it will set you free. I know what that feels like because I was born into a religion and I was always frightened to death about dying and going to hell and all these other things that were told until I grew up and started going to school and reading and questioning and going to the reference books and going to libraries and reading about the history of the human family and where we've been and where we are now and where did things come from. And then it all began to make sense. And finally, one day, finally, this, the, the term is it dawned on me where all of this has come from. And then about 18 to 19 years old, I then realized that there is a world of knowledge that we have never been told. Only a handful of people on the earth are blessed to be able to take that time and read and study where things come from, and we just listen to them. But in point of fact, anyone can do it. All you have to do is just want to know. I wanted to know. So I took the time to study and read and find out where religions come from and where political beliefs and ideas have come from, and why we have international wars and revolutions and violence and bloodshed. Uh, It's very, very interesting, the history of the human family and where we've come from and how we got here and where we're going. And that's that's one of the things I've been wanting to do with my life because there were, there were, when I was a kid and growing up and wanting to know these things, there were people who were giving lectures the best they could with what they knew and showing where things have come from. And I followed everybody. I wanted to hear everyone. I wanted to hear all the teachers and all the philosophers, etc., because I wanted to know. And I really appreciated it. There were certain ones that I found that were absolutely startlingly brilliant people talking about the ancient world, and I was fascinated with that. And so they were explaining where things have come from and why we believe certain things. And so that's where I learned from. And so today I want to do the same thing. I want to give back to the world what what the world happened to give me and that was wisdom and knowledge I wanted to know and I studied I listened to all the teachers and now I know where it all came from now I want to turn around and do that same thing for the people 
today to help them because I know what it was like when I wanted to know. Right. And, now, uh, now keeping know. that in mind, Jordan, I just want to say this. Uh, first of all, I've already got one question, but uh, but I, I want to open it up for questions. Jordan enjoys that, in fact. So uh, if you're in the live chat room at Ocelli.com, which there's about six, seven people over there right now, uh, or if you're on my Twitter and, you know, you're, you're following me on Twitter, you can tweet it to me or message to me a question for Jordan, and I will work it into the conversation as we go. I will get every appropriate question in, just so you know. So you can either tweet me at Ocelli Effect on Twitter or you could go to the live chat room at Ocelli.com. Um, I was going to have the phone set up for tonight, but that's going to have to wait for next week. <laughs> that's we're, okay. We're going to have a new phone system, though, Jordan. It's going to be nice. Okay. Uh, and, and people will be able to call in, which I know you said you wanted to do at some point. But uh, but that's the thing. The, the, this is how you can immediately get some of that wisdom that Jordan has picked up by going to the people with the wisdom. And going to people with the libraries and going to people with the educations. And again, you know, we've talked about Manly P. Hall on this show. We've talked about, I mean, you said you went and you observed teachers. You knew them. You were their friends. You were there. That's right. You worked with them. You went into business with some of them. <laughs> That's over right. Over the years. I, I not only wanted to learn from them, I would go and sit and talk with them wherever they were. I'd go there, fly there and sit and talk with them, and they would introduce me to new ideas and concepts I've never heard of before. And then they would introduce me to their friends that they've learned from, and then I would go and meet them. And then the more I began to meet people and they, and they introduced me to new people, I began to see that there's a world of knowledge that has been hidden from the human family because most people are too busy to go visiting all around the world. People, you know, all their their teachers and but I wanted to do that I wanted to talk directly to the people that knew I wanted the information and I wanted the knowledge because knowledge is power and to know the truth will set you free and boy I can testify to that because I was so concerned about my life I was worried sick about everything and then the more I learned the more I began to see there's nothing to be sick about. It's all very simple. If you just go back and look at the mysteries of the world and where they came from and the religions, it all begins to make sense. And now it doesn't bother me to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And that's what I want to do for everyone else. That's basically what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help people to wake up and realize that there's a world out there of knowledge that you've been, not been privileged to know about. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because the people who are the heads of our institutions, our educational and religious institutions, governmental systems, don't want you to know. They always want to have it over you. They want to... They want to have something on you that you don't know, and they use that against you because you're ignorant and ill-informed and don't know. And that's the way they want to keep you ignorant and ill-informed so you don't know. And now I see, when I watch politics today, now I see what's going on. I know who the players are. I know what the terms and the catchphrases and the symbols and the hand signs I know what it all means, and now it makes a lot of sense to me what's going on politically in the world, because I understand. Mm -hmm. But it's frightening, because I know how much people don't know. The people of this world are not made aware of how the world really works, and I was. I wanted to know, and now I see it, and I want to help other people to see it, so that they can, for the first time, you know, breathe a sigh of relief in knowing what's actually happening. Right. Well, so par pardon me while I interrupt you right there because this is appropriate. The first question that I was holding actually was about this interaction with the religious institutions and the people of the world, effectively. Uh, yep. and, and the question comes from Lawrence, who asks, uh, how far down the pike do you think the people in the churches uh know the truth and know they're holding it from the people because it seems to me that the uh excuse me oh oh the the, the local priest doesn't know that he is 
acting like a controller. What do you think of that? How far up does it go before they know the truth? Now, I, I, I know that sounds like that, an odd question, but but I, I think I know where he's going, and, and I bet you understand what he's asking for you. I know exactly what he's asking. And I think that most of the priests, the priests are on the bottom, then there's the bishops over them, and then over them are archbishops, and over the archbishops are cardinals, and over the cardinals are, are, are other you know, financial powers, international bankers. And that over them are, is the Pope, and over the Pope is the Jesuits, and over the Jesuits are the secret societies of the Roman Empire that still exist today. And so, yeah, as, as a pyramid, it's always a pyramid scheme. There's power, powerful people as you go up, and therefore everybody that you see who are very powerful people know they have bosses also, and they listen to their bosses. And so everybody is a boss and uh, on, over everybody beneath them. But uh, I think that pretty much today, uh, priests uh, around the world, especially Catholic priests, know that they are what they're doing. They know that they are, uh, it's not true, the things that they're teaching to people. Because I have talked with rabbis who tell me, and I've confronted them, and private conversations, and that's the way you find out what people really know, is when you talk to them personally by themselves, when they're not in front of other you know, fellow clergymen. When they're by themselves, they will say, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying, it's true, but I can't say that out there. Why? Because, well, I'm a priest, I can't say that, because everybody will think I'm a fool, and I already know what you're saying is true. And I've talked to rabbis who have basically said the same thing to me. Sure, I know what you're saying. And it's true that Jewish religion has picked up all these ancient pagan religions and interwoven it into our religion. Yeah, I know that. We know that. But what am I going to do? How am I going to tell the world that? I said, you don't have to. I'll do it. I'm doing it. Right. And so... That's, so to answer your question, I think pretty much all adults in, in ministries of any, whatever they are, all adults pretty well know that what they're teaching is not true. It's just the teachings of men, like the Bible has Jesus saying in one of the scriptures in the New Testament, uh, it has Jesus saying to the people of his day, you have formed for yourselves teachers. This is why you are so screwed up in your mind, because you have formed for yourselves teachers, meaning that's what we do. We form associations, and they are clubs, and those clubs become sects, and then from the, from the different political and religious sects, they become churches and fraternal orders and Masonic orders, and before you know it, they become full-fledged churches, and now that they're churches, you have to decide what, what the people uh, who are going to join your church will understand and what they will believe. So you have to form a, uh, a seminary for people to go to, to study. Well, and so if you study, if you go to a seminary and you study hard and you answer the questions correctly, then you get the imprimatur of Caesar on you. The government gives you an accreditation, and now you can become a priest, and now you can become a minister. Why? Because the, 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 the religion you belong to is under the government, and the government gives you permission to be a minister. And therefore, you know, all of this is man-made stuff. It's all man-produced, produced by man, interpreted by man, financed and organized and directed by man and his government. Mm. And so the bottom line is everything it is you think you understand and believe is all a man-made institution. And that's exactly what the scripture said. You have formed for yourselves teachers. In other words, God has not sent you any, anyone. God has not, the divine presence in the universe that you call God has not appointed the people that you hold so dearly because they're the clergy in your church. No, you the one put them there. God didn't put them there. They, they're blind, just like you are. And the blind leading the blind, and you're blind, and you're following them, and they don't know any more about it than you do. 
And so the blind leading the blind have both fallen to the pit. And so that's what's where we are today. People are falling prey to all kinds of nonsensical silliness, ig- ignorance. Why? Because the people in power are teaching them, and they don't know any more about it than you do. Mm. And well, so, so it's just a business. All countries, all the nations of the world, and all the religions of the world are corporations. That's right. something we need to understand. All governments on the earth are corporations. Their business, they are nothing but a money-making, controlling corporations. And that's what a government is. It's a corporation. And that's what you are. You are a corporation. That's why we say, uh, I tell you that somebody is bad company and you say, mind your own business. When you talk about mind your own business and the bad company, Company and business, yeah, and when you get married, they go, you're going to have a partner. This is all commerce. It sounds like nothing but a business. Business, company, partner. And so the whole entire world you live in is a business, Mr. Beal. It's a profound world of business and money and corporations, and it's all being put together by we, the people. And so we are leading ourselves with our own silly ideas and our own ignorant beliefs. We are following. And so that's why I've said so many times, the more we change, the more we stay the same. Mm. We're still believing the same stuff we've always believed for thousands and thousands of years. We're still believing it today, but we just call it something different. See, you know, we that, call it a different word. See, that that's that's something I want to get with you on here because we've talked about this before, too. And, you know, I absolutely understand, agree with, and and fully follow what you're saying. I mean, they, they are grand corporations. I mean, one of the greatest landholders on the planet is the Catholic Church. It's, it's huge. It's rich. That's for sure. I mean, you have uh, special tax arrangements between the governments and the churches. You have, right. uh, you know, the, these very profitable organizations and things. And, and there are all sorts of levels you can join, you know, different levels of commitment for everybody. But here's the thing about it. Just like with government, and this is never a popular statement coming out of my mouth. <laughs> so, so, so brace yourselves. But just like with government, not everything is just blatantly evil all the time for the sake of being evil. Now, now, government is a little less likely to do this, but let's talk about the churches since we're there to begin with. Um, you know, there, there are actually good people that get of involved. There is. Of course there is. And, and really are true believers and walk forward with a smile on their face and believe that they're doing the work of the Lord. And indeed, in some cases, they are. There are churches who feed people, who clothe people that need it, who take care of individuals when when a disaster strikes. Who who are the first people usually there in your community? That's your community churches, you know, after the police get done settling things down and enforcing their policies. uh, When there's no more clean water, I'm telling you right now, the churches will provide it to you a lot faster than the mayor will. Right. I agree with that. You're right. Mm -hmm. But, But that is just mankind's spirit. Wanting to help other people in need. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have anything with your particular religion or your God. It just has to do with a fraternal feeling among people. Your church is filled with people who appreciate when other people are in trouble to go out and help them. Right. We don't want to see children <clears throat> starving. We don't want to see people <clears throat> hurting and, and, and not do something to help them. So it really doesn't have much to do with your religion. It has to do with we the people, and people want to help each other. And so, again, it's we have formed for ourselves associations to help other people. So I understand the situation. It's, It's really very interesting, though, when you find out where the religious teachings that you believe, where the the philosophies that you are following in your church, where they came from, where they first started, and go back and see where it began. Well, well, see, Uh, that's the thing about this, though, is when you see that, you know, and indeed a government every once in a while will accidentally, you know, fail in the direction of helping you, too. Uh, But... 
there is there is the bottom line that there's actually people involved in the equation. So they, of their own ah, sort of uh, natural inclinations, are going to do the right thing, the good thing. And they do intend to do good and right and, quite honestly, are not educated in, in most cases uh, about the, the true nature of what it is they're actually supporting. And even... By doing these things, it's like, well, why would the, you know, the evil uh, uh, entity or why would the difficult entity or why would the destructive entity allow any sort of help to go on? You know, because you've you got you to gotta cloak things in something and you've got to keep the, the well-intentioned person involved so that they'll continue to sink themselves into this. Now, what's interesting, too, is that when we were talking about priests and uh, uh, rabbis, uh, you know, again, a whole array of clergy out there, right? Of course, um, of course. You know, all sorts of ministers and pastors and uh, you name it. They've got lots of different names for them. But it, it is fascinating to me that the rabbis do seem to be a lot more hip to what's actually going on. <laughs> Then, There's then, no doubt in my mind about that. Yeah, and, and I don't know why that is. It's like uh, I, I think that the extremely well-schooled theology person in the Christian world is aware, right? Because after yeah. a while you get to the bottom and you go, wait a minute, something <laughs> doesn't make, you know, oh, okay, now I get it. But for the most part it seems like uh the rabbis are more in touch with what's really happening and what the real symbols are and when you tell them look you know this doesn't make any sense <laughs> uh you know and and well look uh, we just speaking between us well I'll tell you it's true uh and and I know I'm I'm doing a voice here I apologize but I've had these conversations you see I have too and, many of them and, and with guys from <laughs> New York you know with the with with the beard and the whole thing, you know, who yep. will sit there and tell you, well, all right, look, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing we can't go out and say in public. Like you were saying, we can't say this in public. What do you think they do to me if I said this in public? I can't do that. But uh, right. but you're right, you know. But but listen, you gotta you gotta go with the spirit of things, and you gotta understand that, you know, it, they still, even though they know that something goes on, they still go, yeah, but you gotta kind of go with it anyway. And yep, you're right. That's exactly right. And that's what I'm trying to do is wake people up to the fact that you think you may have the truth. You don't. You think you have. But your teachings and your belief systems are based on what other men have come up with in the past, in the ancient history. There were people asking the same questions thousands of years ago that we're still answering and we're still asking today. Where did we humans come from? Where did we go when we leave here? When you die, where are you going? Well, you don't even know where you came from. <clears throat> and we could tell by the way you're living, you don't even know what you're doing now. So how in the world would you even want to think about where you're going to go when you leave here? Just be happy you're going. <laughs> the, the fun is in the trip. So don't worry about where you're going. Just learn... Learn and understand what you're doing here and where you come from, and then you can pretty well figure out where we're headed as people on the earth. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, about how we accept things today and we think we understand where they come from and have no idea in the world. Christians talk about being baptized. And when you're baptized, we say when you come out of the water, you're born again. And they become a born-again Christian because they were baptized. Why do you have to be baptized? Well, that comes from the idea that is a very old and a well-established understanding of the human family that when your mother gave birth to you, her water broke. You came out of water. Her water broke. <clears throat> and you came out and you were born into this world. And so if you're going to be born again, you have to go back into your mother's water and try it again. Come out this time out of your mother's water and live a different life. And so therefore you're going to be fresh and clean. You've washed away your old life. You've come out of your mother's water. Mother nature, mother earth. The earth is your mother. 
And so you go back into her water, into a stream or a river or something, and you douse yourself in Mother Earth's water, and you come out of your mother's water, and now you're born again. That's where it comes from. You're just cleaning up your life by going back into your mother's water and coming out to be born again. Very simple. Another classic example is <clears throat> when you're collecting money in the church, you're tithing, and some people are giving 10% of what they earn, some are 20%, some are 2%. People give money to their religious organizations. We call it tithing. Well, well, we have to do that. Yeah, like George Carlin says, God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's almighty. He's the almighty God, but he can't handle money. He always needs a few more dollars. God doesn't need any of your money. But why do we have a tithing? It's because the ancient world, going back to Europe, realized that when you collect your food at the harvest season, you leave about 10% of the seeds in the food in a storage bin. Why? So that next year you can now have something to plant again. If you eat everything that you have planted last year, then you got nothing to plant next year. Mm -hmm. So now what are you going to do next year? You're going to starve next year. And so what you do is take 10% of whatever it is you were able to get and, 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 you know, and get and what's the word I'm looking for? Um, harvest. Take 10% of your harvest and put it into a storage house. And now next year you will have seeds to plant for new, for more food to come. And so what you're doing is you're giving back 10% of what God has given you to eat, giving it back to God by putting it in the earth, and hopefully it will draw interest and you will have food to eat next year. So that's where the idea of giving 10% back to God. It's not to put, give money. No, the money is going to the people, to the corporations, <clears throat> to the church, which is a business. No, the reason why you give money is because you're giving 10% of the food and the seeds back into God. You're putting it back into the earth, and God makes it grow. And so God will give you something to eat next year. That's where the tithing comes from. It's, it has to do with agricultural, saving the seeds for next year. <clears throat> but we today say, wow, that's a great idea. We could, we could package that and, and, and that's a wonderful idea. Make everybody believe God needs our money and we can build big churches, build these monstrous, huge Vatican's and incredible temples cost millions of dollars and just rape the people and rip them off and take all the money and if they don't give it all to the Lord then they're going to go to hell because we because the church needs the money God needs the money and well, who's going to be the beneficiaries of the money the priests they're the ones that are collecting it well, you, and so gotta, they don't have to go to work right. they don't have to go to work you do <laughs> I was just going to say you got to pay them somehow and that would be by taking some of the currency because, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta adjust part of the cash flow. Notice how these words sound a lot like water. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I wonder where I got that idea from. Oh, right. Jordan's with me. Uh, but <laughs> here, here we go. Uh, you, you take part of the currency or part of the current because that's what they call it when cash or when, when, excuse me, when water is flowing in a particular direction, but also currency is water okay fine you notice how that comes together sure uh anyway you got to do that you got to redirect it because somebody's got to feed the priests obviously uh yeah. but but also like you said there is that concept of harvest now a couple of things came in while we were talking uh let's see jeffrey l because this is not jeffrey matt this is jeffrey l who's a regular listener of mine uh said that he didn't want to ask a question he wants to listen and also wants to uh uh, say that it's very good to hear you again, and he's happy to hear you back on the show again. Um, well, thank you. And uh, that he'll be sending you an email shortly. Okay. And uh, Bree asked about the ancient gods and the pantheon. Uh, and this is, this is fascinating because you mentioned hell, and uh, she mentions some people will confuse Hades with hell in certain literatures. 
Um, and that's fascinating too, because there we go back to the Greek pantheon. And, uh, Brie asks, is, uh, isn't Hades, isn't the god Hades, excuse me, isn't the god Hades actually mentioned in the Old Testament? Now, off the top of my head, I, I don't recall where, but I do believe that the word Hades is actually in there. And in fact, the literal, uh, word for the underworld, uh, uh again, escaping me is also somewhere in the, uh, in, in the Old Testament. T- Tartarus. That, that's what I'm thinking of. Tartarus. Of course. Yeah. Uh, of course. The Apostle Paul talks about the, uh, the people of Tartarus. Uh, yeah. And where you go into the underworld. Well, when they bury you, you're in the underworld. You're not out here in this world. They buried you. So you're in the underworld. And this is why in the, in the Hebrew, there's a word called hell. And we call it, and there's a word in Hebrew for hell, and it's Sheol. Sheol is hell in Hebrew. And you find out, look in the dictionary what Sheol is. It says it's a Hebrew word that we translate today as hell. Mm-hmm. And what does it mean, Sheol? It means just, uh, it's a grave, mankind's common grave. So it's just a grave. And so if you die and you go into a grave, then you are in hell. That's why when you tell people go to hell, it means go die and get out of here. Just right. go die and go into a grave. We're tired of looking at you, so you go to hell. But, but hell to, is nothing more than a grave. Right. That's but, it. but to tag on to uh, to Bree's question here, because H- H- Hades is often thought of as, as hell and this dark. But, but the truth is that everybody would kind of go to where Hades was. He ruled the entirety of the underworld, right, in the Greek pantheon. So it didn't matter, heaven or hell or whatever, whatever your fate was in the afterlife, you were still going to where Hades was. That's right. And Uh, you're still going to hell because hell is a grave. And if you're a human and you pass away, then you're going to the grave. So grave in in Hebrew is hell or or Sheol, which means a mankind's common grave. So why are you worrying about going to hell to burn forever? You know, because I told you that story about when I was when I was a child in Catholic school, and there was a uh, a confirmation service for the children, and we were told that uh, tomorrow night the nuns told us tomorrow evening at the, when you're in church for the confirmation service, all children have to be there. And it's going to be a confirmation service, with the, and the bishop is going to be here, and he's going to officiate over the ceremony. And after the ceremony is over, you children will be confirmed Catholics. And so maybe the, it, it does, not necessarily, but maybe the bishop might ask you, now that you are confirmed Catholic, you may have some questions about your faith that the bishop might answer for you. And so she says, so when the bishop asks if you have any questions, just remember you keep your mouth shut. You don't have any questions. And so that didn't set well with me because even as a child I got questions. And so that night, the next night after the service was over, the bishop did ask, if you children have any questions, I'll try and answer them. So I stood up and raised my hand, and I said, yes, bishop, I have a question. I said, my father works with, with torches, like a welder. And I said, he lets me hold and, and, you know, play with the torches on, on occasions. And so I know what a torch can do. I know how important it is and how dangerous it is. And I said, and suppose I had a torch and I was working with a torch and an angel appeared to me. I mean, I read about in the Bible where angels appear to people. And they they look like humans. And I said, suppose an angel appeared to me and I'm holding a torch. If I hit the angel with a torch, aim the torch at him, would it burn him? Would it harm him? He said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, well, you can't burn an angel. And I said, why can't you burn an angel? He said, because there's spirits. You can't see a spirit, much less burn one. Uh, to burn something, you need something physical like paper or wood or plastic or something that will burn. But you can't burn an angel. I said, why can't I burn the angel? And he said, because angels are spirits and you cannot burn a spirit. 
And I said, then why am I worried about going to hell where my spirit will burn if you can't burn a spirit? And nobody ever thought to ask that simple question. You can't burn a spirit because burning implies fire, and fire is only used in relation to something physical. You can't burn the air. There's nothing there to burn. And so I learned then, like I have other times when I was a child, how much adults don't know. Adults, I would ask people, I would go to different churches as a kid. I would go with my friends at school. Everybody had a different church they were going to, and they all believed that they were right. And now the fact of the matter is none of them were right. That's why none of them agree with each other, because none of them knew what they were doing. Right. And so I would go to the different churches. But the reason I went to the different churches I really sincerely wanted an education in theology. I wanted to know. I don't want to guess or have faith. I want to know where did these ideas come from? What is God? Where does God actually, where, does, where is God? Who am I? Where did I come from? I wanted to find someone who knew what was going on and could teach me and tell me what, about life. And so I finally figured out in my childhood, going to all the different churches with my friends, that no church ever, ever deals with these kind of questions. Nobody deals with them. Why? Because they don't know. And well, so you know, it's, you inter ask, it's interesting you know? there, too, because, you know, we're, we're about to run out of the first hour here. And before we do, uh, I, I want to enter something into the conversation here, which I find remarkably funny. Because you're talking about what it is they know and what it is they don't know. Uh, and, and how they answered you and nobody could answer the question about how do you burn a spirit if, you know, you can't, uh, you can't touch a spirit, you can't do anything with it in the physical world. How do you get fire? You know, somebody once tried to explain something like that to me when I was a kid. And <clears throat> they, they wound up saying, well, you know, hell is really the, the, the fire and all that is a symbol. And, and, and oh. What, and what okay. hell is, is is the worst thing you can imagine, whatever it is. And the worst thing ancient people could imagine was being burned alive because, you know, they, they didn't have uh, the big imaginations we have today. And I said, that's interesting. So, so what do you mean? You know, hell is like what? The thing that you imagine is the worst thing. So, all right, I, I, can, I can go with the idea that God's a mind reader. Fine. And, and this, I was having this conversation when I was maybe seven years old. Okay, yeah. God's a mind reader. Fine, I get that. But tell me something. Isn't that more like what that guy wrote? Uh, his name was Dante, because I, exactly I, right. I knew mm -hmm. about the Inferno, and <laughs> that is not a religious text, although it's constantly referenced by these people. And what's fascinating is, I think it's a whole lot more honest to say, in my opinion, or. Uh, to say, I don't know, but if I had to guess, <laughs> or maybe it relates to this, but, you know, because, uh, Dante could have been divinely inspired and we just don't know that belongs in the Bible, maybe. You know, yeah. uh, sure, why not? I open up the possibilities, but to sit and tell me that you know with certainty certain things when you don't, I find that really dishonest, Jordan, and, um, it's kind of going to lead to an interesting question in the next hour. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> which, uh, which relates to something. And, and I'll set it up here and I'll give you time to think about it when we go to break because, uh, because this is interesting too. And I, and I haven't heard you talk too much about this, but I want to get more from you about it. Um, because divine inspiration and messages from God, this is something that's constantly brought up, right? Uh, uh, today you have people saying Donald Trump is, has been appointed by God. He's, you know, doing God's work. A lot of people say that. A lot of people will say that certain works of art are divinely inspired. Um, I had a conversation on Friday on Aaron Franz's show. <laughs> and you know Aaron. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we were talking about how we didn't know where to put this in context, but it almost seemed like it was messages from the gods sometimes that come through uh, homeless people, that come through 
uh, people that seem to be a bit insane, but suddenly snap to sanity and will give you a piece of wisdom that you could have heard nowhere else. And it's really unique that messages come through some of the strangest places at the strangest times. And him and I, both intelligent guys, didn't know how to explain it. And we left it like that, that this does seem to have something to it. It's not, you know, it's not just our imagination. And we were sharing this experience, talking about how, yeah, you ever notice that these things come from, and we even talked about how uh, maybe even a, a child who seems to know nothing will suddenly look you in the eye and tell you some really deep, wonderful piece of wise uh, uh, information or philosophy, just lay it on you. Yeah, and, a child shall lead them. And and you don't know where it comes from, and it seems like this could be truly divinely inspired, not anointed, <laughs> not chosen. Right. not It was written in the scriptures, but literally in real time, some things are truly divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that people claim is truly divinely inspired is divinely inspired. <laughs> but so too. when we talked about muses before, you and I, um, I, I think it's important to talk about uh, what what that is. And m perhaps, I mean, maybe you have a much better answer <laughs> than what Aaron well, and I came up with. But the question from Kevin will link directly to this in the next hour. And uh, so I want you to put a little thought on it. And I want to hear your take on divine inspiration and okay. what the scripture says about it, what you've learned about it, please. Mm -hmm. Because, again, like I said, I don't know where to put this. When I suddenly even uh, someone who seems to be in, in a bit of trouble will turn to you and stop in a moment of clarity and, yep. and give you something that doesn't even seem to have come from them but through them. See, again, it's like the muses and the art. and all. There's a lot of thoughts there, I know, Jordan, and it's a lot to process. But would you mind going into that in the next hour? No, sure. We'll talk about that. Sure. Because uh, Kevin asked a question about that. And again, guys, I encourage you, uh, if you want, go go ahead and send it to me on Twitter. You can direct message me or tweet it to me, and we'll we'll do it in public. You can hear it, see it happen in real time or in the chat room at Ocelli.com. And next week, uh, when Jordan comes back, we'll try and have the phones running. Um, and we'll take a couple of calls uh, next time, because I know Jordan talked about wanting to do that on the show. Uh, because here's the thing. The ultimate goal here is to expose you to what it is Jordan Maxwell has been collecting over the past, well, more than a half century in his studies. And, of course, a great way to do that would be to go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. That's all one word together, jordanmaxwellshow.com. And you could join the Research Society. There's a one-time thing. Lifetime membership is available. You could go over there and make a donation to Jordan, help him get that new computer that he needs. You could go over there and email Jordan with a question, comment. Uh, if you wanted to hire Jordan, that's available too because, you know what, that including some streaming videos, which are over there for just a couple of bucks, um, all that stuff over there, guess what? It's the only place where the website is actually the Jordan Maxwell. Now here at Ocelli.com and wherever you are listening to us on whatever device or means you're catching the show by. Now this is a Monday and Jordan Maxwell is with us continuing our discussion on theology in general. And we have defined theology at previous programs. Go ahead and take a look back and check it out. We've answered a lot of questions on previous programs. Uh, we, who's we, you know what? Jordan has answered a lot of questions <laughs> on these, on these shows. And, uh, I have just been here to facilitate them, but you can enter them into the chat room at Ocelli.com. You can tweet them at me with the little birdies there over at Twitter. You can do all of that. And, uh, of course, while you're doing that, keep in mind that it's a good idea to go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is the only website which is Jordan Maxwell's. Perhaps I will mention it again before we're done tonight. I'm sure I will. But, uh, hey, you know what? It, it, let's get back to Jordan and the education that's being given to us here tonight in this, the, uh, geez, 19th episode of this series. Um, I, 
I, I I'm not sure if you've ever done this many radio shows, uh, you know, on on one topic, kind of being focused uh, on the one area with uh, with a host before. I mean, perhaps you have. I don't know everything you've ever done, Jordan, but uh, I'm really grateful that you're doing this with us, and uh, I know the audiences as well. So. Uh, uh, first off, I want to thank you for, uh, putting up with me for now 19, almost 20, ep- we're almost at 20 now episodes. Wow. Um, and, uh, the, the, the interesting questions, we had a couple come in during the break. Um, and one of them has to do with divine inspiration, but, uh, but we also had another one, uh, uh regarding the informer. Uh, have you ever heard of the Informer and John Montgomery? So let's deal with that one because that one seems to be the easiest one first. And that came in through Skype of all places, uh, through a contact that's not even in my list, but somehow they figured out a way to ask a question. No, I've never heard of, uh, of John Montgomery or the former Informer, but I, my sense of it is it's probably a Christian uh, or an alternative to Christianity group a church or, or a group that's putting out a newsletter or some kind of a newsletter, a news, news, uh, letter mm. called Informer because I seem to recall I've seen that before. And the Informer was really a religious magazine or religious articles that were put out by someone dealing with off the wall strange subjects in religion. The Informer, I think, is probably uh, a, re- a religious publication of some sort, and the man's name is connected to that. Probably somehow, maybe he's the founder of the church that prints and publishes the Informer. But that's my—that's merely guessing. I don't really know. But it seems to me I've heard uh, something about the Informer in my past, <clears throat> and it had to do with the, uh, with a religious group that was publishing a newspaper. So that's all I know about it. Right. And to the person who asked the question, I mean, if you elaborate on that a little bit more, perhaps we'll be able to, uh, oh, okay, now we know what it is you're looking for here. Uh, because, uh, again, Jordan answered it as best he could. So uh, I don't even know how to say your your Skype handle, so I won't bother, but uh, it's live something or other, blah, 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 blah. So. Uh, but by all means, if you elaborate on that question or rephrase it a little bit, perhaps we can uh, uh, give you some more information or Jordan's view on it or you'll ring a bell. Anyway, the other question was about divine inspiration. And uh, it did refer to, uh, vaguely referred to the conversation I had. And I told you off air, or was it on air? I can't remember uh, <laughs> at this point. But, you know, uh, that, that, that I had this conversation with Aaron Franz where we were talking about um, these inspirational things that seem to come through the conduits of interesting people, not always people that you would uh, immediately associate with the greatest of wisdom. Uh, you know, individuals who are homeless, small children, uh, the, the mentally ill even, um, the seemingly senile they used to call them older people that will occasionally snap to and give you uh serious pearls of wisdom that almost seem as though you know uh, uh they were divinely inspired in one way or another um and here's the thing uh th- this idea that uh the angels would utilize someone in order to uh give a message and all that i mean this is a common trope for lack of a better word uh when it comes to religious symbolism and things like that um but anyway about the divine inspiration and that which aaron and i failed to explain um although i think it does have something to do with the conversation that you and i had not too long ago about the muses um yes. and the the actual you know the, the concept of it in again using the greek pantheon or using the common poetic languages of various cultures, there is this idea of the inspiration from, well, not necessarily the regular physical world, this unseen, uh, not physical world, not three-dimensional flesh and blood world that actually causes great works of art, the uh, most intense of passions, uh, 
uh, gr- great and terrible things together and the beautiful and the most horrific all at once can be inspired from elsewhere. Precisely. There, there are two points I'd like to make about inspiration, two separate points. Mm-hmm. One is Nikola Tesla, the man who gave us alternating current and lit the world and gave us radio. Radio was invented by Nikola Tesla. Marconi had zero, nothing to do with it. He stole. He was hired by by Nikola Tesla. To he he went to Nikola Tesla and asked for a job. And Nikola Tesla, being a generous man, gave uh, this young man a job uh, to help him. And, and his name was uh, Marconi. And Marconi stole from Nikola Nikola Tesla. And I know what that's like. Nikola Tesla had written out how to create something called radio, how to do it electrically. And uh, But Marconi took those papers behind Tesla's back and went, uh, went to the uh, trademark department and trademarked the idea, copyrighted it or whatever you want to call it, and, uh, and, and then put it out there into the public. And then the big companies came to Marconi and said, wow, we want to do this. So they invented radio. And so we're told that Marconi invented radio. No, he stole it from his master. He stole it from the man who gave him a job. And I know what that's all about. I've I've had that happen. And so the idea of inspiration when... Nikola Tesla was in his late 80s, very old man. He was given a big awards dinner in New York, and the where the world was thanking him for all the incredible things that he had given to the world. And uh, and he said in the uh, at the dinner he gave a speech. Nikola Tesla spoke to the audience. And he said, I have to tell you how I got my ideas to do what I've done. He said, every evening before bed, I will put a, a, a notepad on the little table next to my bed with a pen or a pencil. And he said, and every morning when I wake up, there's a written invention on the pad. Somebody comes into my room at night and writes down an invention. And and the next morning I get up and it's all written out for me. And so I just go to my laboratory and follow the instructions and I invented radio or I invented uh, alternating current or I made this invention or that invention. And today Nikola Tesla has lit the world and given us radio and and all kinds of wonderful things this man gave to the world. But he said he was inspired by someone writing it down when he was sleeping. And so that's inspiration. To inspire comes from the word spire, to like perspire, inspire. And so spire is to breathe together. Breathing is spire. And so someone was breathing into him their ideas and coming from somewhere else. Well, that was one point I wanted to make about inspiration is it doesn't necessarily come from you. It comes from out there. And second, it was, uh, was a, I think it was called a TED talk on, on, uh, on the web. The company is TED, TED, and they, and they invite different scientific people and different interesting people. Uh, to give lectures, and they are usually only about 20 minutes long. And this lady doctor was very interesting. She talked about how the brain works and why do humans have a brain? Why do all living things have a brain? And she said, your brain as a human has nothing to do with your creativity, with your ideas and your and your understanding of things. The brain is designed to do only one thing and one thing only. It is to control the mechanisms of your body. It controls the electrical impulses that go to your your muscles so that you can walk, so you can run, so you can climb. It, it controls your body's muscles. 
It controls the movement of the human body. It controls the blinking of the eye, the swallowing of water. It controls everything in your body. It's nothing more than a controlling mechanism for your human body. But the, but when it comes to your imagination, your creativity, she said, the ideas and concepts that come out of you, we have as scientists no idea in the world where your spiritual perceptions come from, where your thoughts come from. We have no idea at all. All that we know is it has nothing to do with your brain. Your brain does not give you inspiration. It merely takes care of your body. And so, therefore, where do your thoughts come from? When the great composers were composing the be- beautiful music, where do those ideas for the, for the music come from? When you get people who are writing profoundly important books, where, and we say they were truly inspired, where well, we know it wasn't in their mind, it came from outside of their brain, so it implies that our inspiration is being, we are being overshadowed is the term that I use. Mm. Overshadowed by some kind of a higher intelligence in the universe. Something out there is feeding us information and it's called inspiration. We are being inspired. And some people are just naturally pick up on inspiration from out there, wherever it comes from, and they can create beautiful music, beautiful art. They can design rockets. They can design lasers, <laughs> televisions, all kinds of strange and wonderful imaginations in the human mind, but it does not come from your brain. It comes from out there. Well, and, and that, so that makes the, sense, the out- though. That, yeah. that makes so much sense because, you know, I want to go back to where you were talking about Spire. Because if you read the accounts of various creation stories, uh, at some mm-hmm. point, the breath of life is breathed into man, right? Precisely. Um, exactly. And here's the interesting part about that. A respiration, when, you know, you're, you're, you're having somebody put a, a mask on you to assist your breathing, that's respiration, right? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. To conspire is to breathe together, which means you're working together, you know, you're mm-hmm. toward a goal, all of that. But, see, spire sounds a lot like spirit, and it does seem to me as though, you know, uh, that, that, that spirit and spire, that they must be related together. And this is me putting the dots together from what, what you say and also from some other sources. Um, the, the breath of life obviously comes from outside of you. So, That's right. you know, the breath of life and the fact that you are inspired, you are given breath in, if you will, uh, from somewhere else. And where does the Precisely. air come from? Well, the air was provided to you by the Creator, obviously, but the original breath you took, you must breathe in before you can breathe out, <laughs> or you must breathe out before you can breathe in. Either way, it, it doesn't matter. The whole thing doesn't work without something coming from outside. So, to be inspired, to conspire, all, all of these things, spirit inspire, they just they just sound pretty similar for some reason. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, 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 and here we go. Even, even the act of life, you know, that first breath. Yeah. Uh, it, it is the aspiration, right? Because an aspiration, this is where you don't have the breath yet, but you're looking for it, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Because you're, you're aspiring to do something. Aspire is, is, is a huge thing. Spire, spirit, the breath of life, if you will, and, and the breath of an idea coming in from elsewhere uh, uh another guest i had uh, sa- says that you know uh, all people are, are subject at all times to external input and yep. that's uh i guess true on all levels if you consider from the mechanical need for breath to the concept of spirit and the concept of life even uh you know what what, what happens when you expire <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, that's literally what they call it when you die in a lot of cases. That's right. Uh, so X would be out of, well, your breath is now out of you. And once your breath is out of you, you're dead. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so it's an interesting thing there that 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 aspire it just seems to be a a much larger grander kind of uh idea than people give it credit for they just sort of take it for granted and if you think about it just commonly anybody listening right now could shut their eyes and you don't often give a lot of thoughts to the every breath you're taking but without every breath you're taking quite frankly nothing else is going to happen is it that's right and so many times we know it's happened to me so many times uh in my life, I have been confronted by a problem <clears throat> that other people cannot handle. They can't figure out what to do, even in, in building, even in building and, and secular work. Uh, you're confronted by something that happens, and, and how do you fix it? Well, we don't know how to fix it. Well, some people are just inspired. They say, well, wait a minute. Why don't you just do this and connect us here and then, you know, and then plug this in over here and there it is. It works. Well, how did you know how to do that? I don't know. I just figured it out. Just, it just occurred to me. Well, how did it occur to you? I was inspired. Somebody or something out there told me when I was looking at it. It told me in my mind how this thing worked and I was inspired to do it. And so when you listen to the composers of music, uh, you can tell they were inspired. They didn't just read it out of a book. They knew how the mathematical tones work. They know how music works. And that's a incredibly dark subject, how the tones of music work and, and how to put them together to cause people to be inspired to do good things, to do bad, to do incredible things with music. Music can be inspire, inspirational. I mean, they play they play drums and, and certain kinds of music for the military, and it makes a man feel like he, uh, he's a man. He, wants, he can defend himself. He can defend the country because of this music. And it's just an inspiration for military inspiration. And, uh, and, and of course, in Hollywood, you have what is called programmed music. It's called programming music. In a movie, when something evil is going to happen, you get a certain kind of, of music. When something is going to be funny and silly and, and to be laughed at, you get that kind of music behind it. So it's programming you, your mind with music so that you are inspired to get the idea out of the movie. So inspiration is not part of what the brain does. Inspiration comes from outside the brain, which means whatever it is out there, the way I, when I talk to about, when I talk to audiences about God, I think it's important to define your terms. Because so many times other people have other ideas about something you're talking about. If you talk about love, uh, many different people have many different ideas about what that word means. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about God, I believe that our, the human family, the human people on the earth, their brains are a computer. We're an incredible computer. It's alive. And that computer runs on wiring. And we're told that we, our blood vessels and our nerves are miles and miles of nerve endings in our body. That's the wiring for the computer to all the body, to control the body. The brain needs to be able to send messages out to certain nerves for you to do certain things. And so the brain is a computer and i believe that what we call god is some kind of a for a lack of a better term some sort of a wi-fi unit mm. whereby you can have a hundred different computers in a room and they're all on a one wi-fi unit which means all 100 computers can be doing 100 different things tuning into different different places and doing different things and they're all getting it from one source from a Wi-Fi unit. So in my mind, I think of some sort of an electromagnetic 
force in the universe that is brilliant, is highly intelligent, is extraordinarily well informed, and it is communicating with us like a Wi-Fi does to computers, because all of us have brains and they're computers. Mm. And so something is, is, is guiding our destiny. Something out there is guiding our thinking. And if you've ever seen a flock of birds, large, large flocks of birds with thousands of birds, and you see them all flying in one direction and it instantly, in, a, in an absolute one-second instant, they all turn, all the birds turn and go a different way. And they all then flip back and turn and go a different way. How come all of the birds knew to turn at that very one-second point and they all turned and went a different way together, like the fish do. We call it schools of fish. And I've seen it where the fish are thousands of fish, and they're all sailing along together and instantly. All of a sudden, they all go in a different direction. How is that possible? Each one of them will, uh, you know, can go wherever they want. No, they can't. They go together, and wherever, when, and when they're supposed to turn, they will. Everybody will turn instantly. It's some kind of an inspiration, which I tend to think is something like some sort of a Wi-Fi unit. I'm just using that very loosely. Some mm -hmm. kind of a communication with a higher mind in the universe that men have called God. Right. It's you you know, you, you've, inspired, wise... you've inspired a question here uh, because I, I love the concept of a Wi-Fi unit. Now, I'm not sure if the Wi-Fi unit is just the way... The, just the way I'm using it. I'm yeah. just using that term. Well, no, it's okay, but I'm, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if the Wi-Fi unit is God or if the Wi-Fi unit is just the best way that God can possibly even funnel things to these other little teeny tiny computers, which we are. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure because, look, it's not like we could handle or your your let, let's go with your cell phone, your laptop, whatever. You're, it's not going to handle the whole Internet at once. No. Okay, so it's got to go through something. And and here we go about talking about different mechanisms because you brought up music. I don't know if you've ever done a presentation on music, but music links to everything. And you've known some great musicians, Steve Allen being one of them. He, he was actually a very talented uh, multi-instrumental musician. That's uh, right. Not, not the thing he's prominently known for, but I assure you it's true. I, I don't have to assure Jordan. Jordan knew him, but... I assure you, the listener, that Steve Allen was a uh, played multiple instruments of all sorts, um, and and well, by the way, that's but, right. But here's the thing: uh, music, in and of itself, it is simultaneously mathematical. It is uh, geometric in that uh, tone can be measured uh, in shape, so to speak. Uh, you have rhythm, which is clearly mathematical and also, um, and he, when you understand yeah. the great composers during the Middle Ages, the great composers in the late and the Renaissance composers, if you understand what they were doing, they're not just picking sounds that sound nice. No, it was mathematical. It was very deep understanding of the of the creation of the universe the breathing in and the breathing out of 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 uh the universe it was a very extraordinary story about how the great composers did what they did and composed the music it had to do with an occult heavy duty science mm -hmm. of vibrations rhythms and how the and, and they could change the whole concept of a nation by music. I mean, the Germans used the music from Wagner, and, and it inspired. And America has music that inspires the nation because there is some kind of a mathematical science to it. There's a science to putting music together. And, and the great composers realize that. And today, the master musicians today, musicians today, know that, that you need to understand how the universe vibrates and how the, you know, and Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans, they understood the mathematics of the universe and how to write music. It's an incredible story of how to be inspired.
Mm. You have to know what you're doing when you're a composer putting music together because it's going to affect the brain waves of the people of the world when they hear it. And it's really an incredible story. And I've heard people explaining how the great masters wrote their music. It's very, very deep. It's not just listening to pretty sound. No, no. Well, right. They did it with a vibrational. They knew how it would be vibrating in your mind and what your brain would do with this particular vibra- a vibra- vibratory frequency. One incredible story about how the brain communicates with the heavens and the heavens communicate with you. And we know that the planets and the sun and the moon affect your brain. Mm. And the planets all have a resonant frequency and each one of those planets when you were born affected your mind. When you were born, you came out of your mother into the world and the sun has a profound electrical feel on the earth that is causing incredible stuff to happen. Our weather, the moon affects people. It affects the female. It affects her uh, her periods Uh, once a month. is caused by the moon. The moon pulls the oceans of the world. We know that the moon affects the oceans. Why? Because they're water, and the moon affects water. This is why your body is like 76% water. So how does the moon affect you at the full moon? Well, it causes you to get silly and crazy, sometimes really crazy. So we call you a lunatic. (laughs) Why? Because the moon is affecting your blood. It's affecting your brain. The vibrations in your mind are being affected by the sun, the moon, Mars, Jupiter. And so women are from Venus and men are from Mars, meaning our minds operate differently because of the way we are born and and who we are and the vibrations in the brain. It's a very big subject about inspiration. And, and the inspiration comes from out there. Well, right. And, and the, the thing about this, too, is that, uh, you know, when you examine, okay, the very basic elements, melody, uh, rhythm, harmony, the, these sorts of things, all of these have mathematical components to them. They have very precise measurements. You can bet uh, on it. You know, That's and, right. and tones and such. Now, here's the thing about it. You, you talked about how Hollywood utilizes these things for particular purposes, but, you know, before there was a Hollywood in California anyway, uh, uh, religions you, you utilize this as well. I mean, even today. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. In, in, in synagogues, they sing. Yes. They're, they're, uh, they, they, they sing certain things for certain reasons. Tone is certainly something that goes on. You have, uh, your, your hymns in Christian churches. Chants. Yeah. The chanting and Christian chants, the Gregorian chants. The chants. All mm-hmm. mathematical. It's, it's really quite a story about inspiration and how the brain can be inspired by vibrations from space. Well, right. And even, even when you take a look at something which is more modern, uh, like gospel music, which, which I happen to appreciate gospel, uh, yep. you know, a, a lot of it, not all of it, but, uh, the, I, cause full disclosure, I, I was a musician and, uh, not, not a soup. Superiorly sophisticated musician, but sophisticated enough to recognize, uh, the power. And you can even see, uh, in, 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 in you know, at, at a rock concert or at a concert of any type where an entire crowd can become seemingly mesmerized. That's uh, right. By a performance, uh, they, they become engaged in certain group activities. And that means that whether it is that, a uh, trance-like state you see at, uh, at at a at a ballet or uh, a classical music uh, a presentation through orchestral means, or if you're watching a mosh pit, it doesn't matter. There is a a, a thing which happens here, where the cadence, the rhythm, the uh, harmony, lack thereof, or disharmony. You see, because disharmony is useful just like harmony is. Never forget. That something that is incongruous and mathematically, diametrically opposed or precisely placed in a certain way, you know, even the exposition of conflict is useful to create a certain condition in the observer. 
and Absolutely. trauma is something that is useful to create a condition in the in the mind of the observer. So whether you're attempting to soothe the savage beast with it, you know that mm-hmm. old phrase, or to yeah. wake it up, uh, you you can achieve either through this. And again, this is uh, a, a a bit more mystical than accidental and a bit more precise than people give it credit for. And I think uh, the fact that it's uh, pervasive throughout religions of all sorts, there are of musical... Of all sorts, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the ancient religions use chants and music, and it inspires your mind. And, and we know that the planets inspire you. And uh, as a matter of fact, during the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, uh, the word for the stars was, we spell star, Mm S-T-A-R. But in the Middle Ages, the church, uh, the word star was A-S-T-A-R, Astar. So in Astar, we take the A off and just spell it S-T-A-R. But no, it was originally an Astar of the little lights that they have as well, Astars. And so there was even a Jewish family, a very famous Jewish family called the Astars. Astar was a star. And so the idea was developed during the Middle Ages in in the church that if you don't follow the Astars, if you don't know how the Astars affect you, because they do affect you, it's called astrology, and most people laugh at it. Well, there's nothing to laugh at. The stars do affect you, and so the, you're being affected by the astars. But if you don't know that, your life is going to be a disaster. Mm. And that's where we get the word a disaster. A disaster means you don't follow the astars because the ancient peoples you use the stars to navigate around the world on the high seas they would use the stars and so if you and so if they use the stars to navigate the world on the high seas the idea was expressed in religion that you should use the stars to navigate your life because they affect you and if you don't know how to use the stars then your life is going to be a disaster a disaster because you don't realize you've never been told and you've been lied to and mis- misunderstand and you don't know how the stars and the planets affect you. You are a part of the universe and the moon affects your, your blood. The moon affects your a woman. The moon affects your water in your body. That's why we call people uh, lunatics. <clears throat> so... There's so much more to learn about inspiration. It's, a, it's an incredible subject. It has a wide array of entries into that subject, which is just uh, astounding how much mathematics and vibrational frequencies all affect your brain and gives you the idea that you can create out of nothing. You can create things. Uh, you know, it just is in your mind to do it. You just were inspired to do it. Hmm. I've written, I've written things in my in my time that people have read, and they said, "My God, this was inspired." I know that when I was writing it, I didn't realize what I was writing. I felt it. I didn't know intellectually. I felt the knowledge, and I was writing down what I was feeling. And when I was through with it, people read it and said, my God, this is inspired. What do you mean inspired? Well, I mean, I, I just felt something leading me to write the way I wrote. Right. And therefore, you can call it inspiration. Well, you So know, it's a big go, story. Yeah, no, absolutely. And going along with these lines just really quickly, uh, I'd like to get your commentary on this because uh, some people might say, well, you know, Chuck, not every church has uh, uh, music. But you see, it does. <laughs> Here's the thing. In some cases, music is not necessarily with a pipe organ or a choir. That's um, right. There, there is the use of tone and the utterance of words. Now, That's sometimes right. words are there for the purpose of making a point, and there's hidden meanings in those words, but it goes beyond necessarily, uh, it goes beyond, not, not necessarily just relegated to, I should say, uh, uh, etymology, the true meaning, 
where it came from. Uh, it, that that is not necessarily all there is to it. Well, look Sometimes at rap. The, well, the tone. Well, b- before we even go into rap, the tone of certain words and the actual use of certain syllables lined up together. You answer back and forth. There is a. Uh, uh, a question and response that kind of goes between the presenter at the church who, you know. You're right. You're right. And, Absolutely. And, and if people go, well, not really, not really. Well, which which Christian church do you not all say amen or also That's with right. you or, you know. So be it and all that. Yeah. So these things are not necessarily just there to program you to respond automatically without thought, but they are there for that, too. Um, but, but in some cases, even the utterance of those words in, in, in mysticism in all forms, the use of particular sounds, just the sound is just as important. And like I say, what, what is music but a complex arrangement of said sounds? So, of course. you know, in, in a way, even when you don't have music in the church, you still have the use of sound. And we talked about it on this show also, the concept that uh, the architecture of these things, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the great cathedrals and everything else, you, you ever notice they sound wonderful? And, um, right. you know, the, 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 the choir sounds uh, five times larger than it is or w- would ever sound in a square room somewhere. Because they're literally designed that way for acoustic, you know, uh, uh, absolutely. They absolutely. You're right. That's a, that's. Uh, I've I've listened to professional musicians explaining the pipe organ and the organ, and how, you know, it reverberates off the walls and the ceilings, and the, and it comes back to you, and how music needs to be presented to you in a theater a certain way and there's a very big difference between the vibratory uh, frequencies of real incredible music and what we got today called cyber. Mm-hmm. Cyber is very dangerous to the human brain. Cyber hearing you hearing music on the on the disc and it's a, you, know, you play it on a computer and you're hearing this beautiful music, but no, it's cyber. It's not, it's not the same. And there have been some very important documents written by doctors in Europe talking about hearing music on a cyber machine as opposed to a record, which is a vibra- vibration uh, playing on a record. Uh, the records are the right way to hear music. Cyber is not. Cyber is not the way to hear music. It affects your brain, and we're being affected by cyber. You know, today we are, we know that through our telephones and through our cell phones, cyber is not that great. It's an incredible invention, but it's not that great for hearing, especially for humans listening to music. Cyber yeah. is not that good. You know, I've often wondered about that because, uh, again, the the very mystical ideas see i'm not super sophisticated on this subject but just sophisticated enough to know there's a difference I, i've wondered about that sort of shallow nature of the digital media versus uh anything let's let's go back to music for just a quick second well yeah. when you hear a recording of someone playing a guitar and it could be anything name a common song i don't care what it is you hear that guitar, you recognize it, you know what it is. It's a common song. I mean, it could be uh, Happy Birthday. I don't know. It could be, jeez, uh, 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 name in America. America the Beautiful I heard on a guitar recently, um, which I heard it played very well. And, uh, and, and not commenting on patriotic music or anything here. Let's stick with the guitar. Um, and, and I've heard it played well in a digital sense. Now, when you catch uh, in your ear someone playing a physical guitar where the natural reverberating strings are now traveling directly to your ear that's right you exactly will exactly right you will get a completely different impression <laughs> completely different emotional reaction you may recognize it and say okay that's the same song which I heard in a digital way, and digital recordings are nice and clean, and they seem very orderly, and they seem very accurate. But they lack the natural 
you know, and this isn't me going, gee, I wish they would go back to records, which I wish they would, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's not that's not what I'm saying. Uh, th- there is a difference between what has been preserved in a digital way and the actual real thing, the natural thing. It's like... Uh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. That's precisely what I'm saying. And incidentally, there is a very big company back east that is now reviving the idea of records. They are now pressing records and taking all this, the so-called music of today and actually putting them onto vinyl records. Mm. And it's a big company. You go on the web and check it out and find out the company that's producing music now on records and they're producing the the players, record players, uh, because they, they've come to the conclusion that you know, to really appreciate the beauty of music, you have to do it on a record. You can't mm-hmm. do it with cyber. Well, you and may so. not know this, Jordan, but but a lot of uh, a lot of record companies and individual <laughs> artists who put out their own stuff have now uh, uh, gone to this concept of creating a limited run of uh, of vinyl records for new releases, which mm-hmm. I didn't think we would see. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems very strange, but everything from uh, uh, you know, brand new artists, and I do mean brand new, you never heard of them, and uh, I never heard of them, and probably nobody's ever heard of them, and who knows if we will hear from them again. Uh, artists are coming out that have uh, record deals with brand new, they just put it out in 2019, music, and it's on vinyl as well as, you can yep. get it MP3 and you can get it digitally. Uh, even artists who've been around for 20, 30 years who haven't produced a piece of vinyl in the past 20, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, they're, they're even coming back around with, uh, with vinyl versions. Uh, That's right. and, and that means, I mean, everything from heavy metal artists to, uh, to jazz artists are putting yep. this stuff out on vinyl again. So it's not just one company. It seems to be across the board. There's a, it's, it's not the prominent trend yet. But it is, you know, worthy coming enough. Back. It's coming back. Well, right. li- listen, no, nobody's going to do it if they can't make money at it. And obviously, there's an appreciation and a market for it, right? That's so, right. You know, th- there's a reason for all that. But so, you have to scientifically yeah. understand how digital affects the human brain through the ears. You have to understand that. Mm-hmm. Then you can appreciate why the vibration on a, on a record is different than vi- uh, on the vinyl is different right. than and the digital and why hearing it on a on a vinyl record is far far superior. So mm-hmm. you have to understand the science behind it. Most people don't. I've heard it. I don't understand it necessarily completely, but at least I've got a, a, an idea because I've heard the experts explaining it. And I get the idea. Well, right. I have a real general question because I know you, you you probably haven't, you know, listen, one of the few things Jordan doesn't seem to know uh, a, a huge, huge amount about, <laughs> right, yep. is this. But I think you can answer this question if you're aware of these uh, uh, looks into it by uh, by people who are well, well schooled on it. Is, uh, is, is this, is, is it a matter of it's just so artificial that it doesn't, really do what the original music did, which is what I contend anyway. But um, is it just that, or does it actually seem to do damage according to what these guys are finding? Well, the doctors in Europe I've heard and listened to uh, says it actually does damage to the nervous system uh-huh. and the brain, the way that you accept the vibrations and translate it into music for the mind. It actually does damage and this is why we're talking about what cell phones do to you, how cell phone is digital, and how that affects your brain, the, set, uh, the, the vibration from the cell phone, and therefore you apply that to the music that you get on the, on the disc. Mm-hmm. So digital is not really very good for the humans. Yes, it see, is I, interesting to be able to use it and how it right. works, but it's not really superior. No, I understand that. But I was curious about this for one reason, and that is that uh, I thought, you know, well, look, let, let, let's talk about the cell phone for a second. Um, this idea that you're you're so accustomed to dealing with images of and avatars of and digital voices 
uh, this kind of thing. I, I have always been under this impression that it was uh, uh, there for the express purpose of blurring the line between a real voice, a real thing, and 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 indeed, I, I do believe I've been proven correct over time that that's certainly what part of the purpose is. It but, is. Uh, but 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 I'm wondering if if that's you know not all there is to it. But what do you think about this concept? You know, where just like with the music and everything else, and see how does this relate to religion? You might be asking yourself. I think I think <laughs> that the, I think that the masters of this world, the guys at the very top of the world, the scientists who are designing our world for us because we don't we don't understand how it works and so the masters who are the real brains are designing our world for us designing computers and rockets and lasers and all the other high technology they are working toward one goal and that is to hom- homogenize the whole of life on the earth Bring everybody together in one place, no matter what race, color, creed, where you are from. It doesn't matter. They're making all humans uh, conform to one thing. We all will one day all be able to communicate together, and we will all be under one government, one religion, one concept, and there will be no more individuality, no more of this human individualism as God's as going it's getting just understand human creativity and individuality is slowly but surely methodically and scientifically being weeded out of the human race we're losing our individuality we're losing our human humanity we're losing our minds. We're losing our country. We've lost our freedoms. We're just losing, period, to our superior people who are working to entrap us, to cause us to, you know, to live the way they want us to. And they don't want any individuality. They are not interested in having any nationalities. Mm-hmm. You know, the Italians being Italian for Italy and the French being French for France. And the British being English for England, no, they don't want that. They want people, everybody to be amalgamated into one big, happy criminal family. One big family on the earth where there is no allegiances to anything, not to your mother, not to your family, not to your country. Uh, nothing you have your allegiance to the masters who run the human race right. that's why they're digitizing everything and bringing us all together whether you want to be together or not they are amalgamating everything right. all around the world and the so purpose that be right. no individuality no more creativity and, they and, will decide what you know exactly and the purpose of this obviously just like with the music see this goes all the way across the board uh, one of the, one of the greatest things that has ever been done for them to be able to make this easier to transition into the world of the unreal is to distance us much further from things which are, uh, actually true connections. And we've talked with Jordan about the true connection to the divine and how we are being kept from it. We have talked to him, uh, about the destiny of the living man and woman here on the earth and how that has also been hijacked. But religion is one of those vehicles, which is at the base of all of this stuff. See, without right. religious order, you couldn't have governmental order the way it is. You couldn't have the industries doing what they do. You couldn't have the acceptance and the propaganda being fed to people based on their ignorance and One thing you will not find if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com is a lot of ignorance, except if Jordan decides to illustrate and point it out, which, you know what, I think there are some crazy things that you point out in the the research society section, which are pretty good illustrations of ignorance, (laughs) but mostly... 
uh, uh, they're, they're not there because he's teaching you ignorance. He's showing you someone else's ignorance. But, uh, but, but at the same time, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge and a huge amount of information there in the research society. New stuff is being added all the time, which you can get to the research society through jordanmaxwellshow.com. As I said before, there's a couple of streaming videos over there. There's an email contact. There's a donate button. There's a, public section which you can take a look at as well jordan would love to hear from you get a donation from you uh you know the research society that helps out the webmaster over there to keep things going there are many terabytes of information still to be added to the research society of which i am a member just for full disclosure right here and the only website which is actually jordan maxwell's is jordan maxwell show Dot com. That's all together. Jordan Maxwell Show is all together. Jordan Maxwell Show dot com. So, Jordan, we're closing out this particular episode, and I do believe it's 19. I'll have to double check, but I think it's 19 now. And uh, I want to thank you again for going through this with me and putting up with me because I know well, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm fascinated with the show that we're doing. I love doing it. I really enjoy doing it with you. One thing I would tell everyone is on my jordanmaxwellshow.com, you will see my, as you said, my research society that you can join. But when you join it, there's one folder in that research society. It says um, interesting articles. Mm-hmm. I have my webmaster put on some articles, on interesting articles, that you will not find anywhere on the earth, period. Nobody has it, and nobody knows it. Some extraordinary stuff about your government and where you come from and who you are, according to the International Maritime Admiralty Governmental Laws of the Universe, It's a a most incredible story that no one has ever talked about in public. And I've got the documents, and it's all explained step by step. And I'm telling you, you've never heard the story. So if you go on my research society, go to interesting articles. I have many different folders opening up all kinds of stuff from research articles, audio, video, words and terms and symbols, and, and all kinds of pictures and incredible stuff. Well, there's also ebooks, also ebooks, and uh, some stuff which was inspirational to you. Other people's presentations, which were uh, inspirational to you, yep. in certain ways, yep. are in there as well. Just wanted to point that out. But uh, yeah, that's available all at the uh, Research Society, which you can get to that link through a button, which is on the front page of JordanMaxwellShow.com, right? Right, it's right there. It says Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Click here and join. Very simple. And it will take you a long time to go through what's on there. It's a massive website, but we got ten times that much coming, coming. I've just got an enormous amount of research I've been doing over the years, but I only have one webmaster, and he's very, very good, and I really like him. He does a great job, but there's only one man. He can only do so much in an eight-hour day. And so he's putting it on as soon as he can, as quick as he can, and it's pretty extraordinary stuff when you go to interesting articles and some of the religious pictures and stuff dealing with religion. It's an incredible website. Nobody else is doing what I'm doing. And I've heard so many people tell me that. The kind of stuff that you find on my research society, nobody is talking about. Nobody knows anything about it. I'm the one that spent 60 years looking into the dark side and seeing all of the dark lies and deceptions in religion, government, secret societies, fraternal orders, commerce, banking, military, it's an extraordinary story of the life we live, and that's what I hope to do is to be able to provide people with all the documentation and pictures to prove where we are and where we've been and where we're going. It's all there on my website. Go to Jordan Maxwell's show. Anything besides Jordan Maxwell's show is not mine. That's right. JordanMaxwellShow.com is the only website for Jordan Maxwell. It's the only one that is. Doesn't matter where else you see his name, that one is actually his. 